Hello everyone, it's Shaw here, the host of the Inquisitive Grin podcast. It's season three and episode three, and today we're welcoming Dr. Gayla Gorman. Gayla is a licensed acupuncturist, naturopath, and author, and she offers advice and programs to help reverse health issues resulting from chronic stress. She talks a lot about toxic stress as well, and today we're going to define that, and she's going to give you some examples and ways in which you can begin to minimize and even get rid of toxic stress. She advocates for getting to the root of the cause of health issues and treating it naturally, and I'm a huge proponent for uh, natural medicines. Of course, I'm a complementary therapist as well. She encourages people to be their own health advocate, their own primary care person. It was really interesting to get her thoughts on how stress starts, how it begins, how we can begin to alleviate stress, and also how not to get stressed in the first place. And she gives some ideas and some thoughts about where to start. We also talk a bit about what helps her as well on her daily path to stay perhaps centered and calm. And we do share some of the same practices. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Gayla to the show. Gayla, Gayla. so lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. It is great to be here, Shaw. I'm looking forward to our chat and, um, and helping your audience understand better how stress turns toxic. Yeah, this is a brilliant topic. So should we start with how or what drew you towards studying complementary therapies as opposed to going the traditional routes, perhaps? Yeah, so um, I have been interested in alternative thought, I guess you would call it, um, since I was a teenager. So that particular avenue wasn't new to me. I have kind of an open mind and I'm always interested in differing viewpoints. But when I was um, in my 20s and essentially my first career, I was um, an accountant and actually became a CPA. And I ran an accounting firm into my 30s and um, consulted to physicians, medical doctors. And uh, it was just striking to me when I saw it from the inside, how kind of backwards it seemed that what was being emphasized and focused on wasn't really solving any problems. <laughs> and, and in a lot of cases was creating more problems. And so that was the early days of my interest in using alternative approaches to dealing with health issues that actually created long-term results, you know, not just a short-term Band-Aid approach. And then, you know, there's a, um, a long decades uh, of history, how that evolved to get to where I am today. But, um, but I ended up selling my interest in that accounting firm and then pursuing um, this more alternative path. Um, initially, from the business perspective, and then eventually I just accepted that what I really wanted to do was, you know, get my hands in the clay and help people um, address these issues. So, uh, so that's, that's how I got here. Wonderful. So which came first, acupuncture? Um... So um when I started studying alternative medicine in earnest and really getting becoming interested in more of an Eastern philosophy, Eastern philosophy is really ancient wisdom applied to health, right? And um, Oriental medicine in particular. And everything I studied, all these kind of alternative um, approaches, state-of-the-art technology applied to um, health and wellness, um, they were all tapping into this energy system that the oriental medicine practitioners call the acupuncture meridians. And um, 
And so that was kind of a repeated theme over quite a few years. And honestly, when I first started encountering it back, you know, in my thirties, um, which, you know, is almost 30 years ago now, when I first started encountering this, I didn't realize that, uh, somebody like me could become an acupuncturist. Like it never, it was so far outside my paradigm <laughs> that I didn't even poke or poke at it to say, well, how do I become one of those? Right. And so it took me quite a few years before I finally um, ran into a group that was providing acupuncture treatment at a place that my husband was working at. And at that point I was like, Oh, I get it. I get how it all fits together. And then I, you know, started following down that path and became an acupuncturist um, because I wanted one, the formal education, but two, the ability to become a licensed practitioner. Because as a CPA and a licensed professional in my former career, I felt like that was important. And um, and so it was just a natural um, thing for me to pursue uh, a lot of years and a lot of, um, you know, formalities for board exams and and uh, a lot of hoops to jump through. But um, but I uh, acupuncture was just uh, becoming an acupuncturist for, and becoming formally licensed was really just um, the end result of studying this for decades. So I see. So with naturopathy, uh, and I interviewed Debbie Cotton, a naturopathist on the podcast. She's also a psychotherapist. Um, but she kind of took a slightly different route. So when did naturopathy come in? So not, I got interested in naturopathy um, actually before the acupuncture thing. <laughs> and, um, and so I was interested in using homeopathy. There was, a an MD, he was a medical doctor that I, um, saw in the nineties. So it's again, been, you know, um, close to 30 years now. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was an MD an internal medicine doctor, but he practiced um, he, acupuncture. He used needles. He used um, kinesiology, which is like muscle testing. Okay. Yeah. And he used homeopathy. And, um, and he was particularly focused on identifying food sensitivities, food allergies, and, um, and used that process um, all those tools in his tool chest to identify what was causing the problem. And back there are tests now that we can use that kind of help us um, drill, drill down into it even more. But back then it wasn't as easy to test this stuff. So, um, so I got interested in homeopathy and how all these things blend together all the way back then and again, one thing led to another. I discovered naturopathy and how naturopathy kind of blended the use of all these um, techniques. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, I don't know how it is there in the UK, but in the United States, there's only a few states that license um, practitioners that use naturopathy. And um, and so when I was exploring my um, sort of end goal, the path that I was taking, um, there was a lot of overlap between naturopathy and acupuncture or oriental medicine, but they're the only one that really was a path to licensure was becoming an oriental medicine practitioner. So that was, for me, it really isn't one or the other. They're very much intertwined and overlapping, but my licensing is as an acupuncturist. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. People come to me to get help figuring out some mysterious 
thing that nobody else has been able to figure out. <laughs> so um, whether they think that acupuncture is what they need to try or naturopathy is what they need to try, you know, um, when they come to see me, I use my tools and technology um, essentially based on quantum physics and bioenergetics. And I kind of um, weed through all the possibilities and um, help us know where to start. And then typically for somebody that I see, whatever they've got going on, has been going on for a while. And so it doesn't just typically resolve overnight. It kind of gets reversed in layers. So we have to like deal with this issue that is um, the first layer in order to get to the next layer in order to get to the next layer. So it takes us three or four, or sometimes half a dozen layers of, you know, peeling through things before we finally get back to the point where we can really address what was going on initially before people started suppressing symptoms, which drove it further into the body. And then now you've got all this other noise going on that you've got to try to um, uh, sift through to figure out what's really going on. Does that help? Did, did that? Absolutely. Kind of Absolutely. Explain it in a way that yeah. makes sense. It does indeed. And it also brings me to the point about the complementary part of acupuncture, homeopathy, um, naturopathy, all of it. Uh, what are your thoughts about having that as a complement? Because sometimes people will say, well, you know, I'm seeing my doctor, I'm on this medication. So I want to come off of that and just do homeopathy or just have acupuncture. So as um, a complementary medicine practitioner, it is outside of my scope of practice to diagnose any sort of Western medicine diagnosis that uh, any diagnosis that you would get from a medical doctor, I if you bring that diagnosis to me, I'm going to take that diagnosis and I'm going to essentially set it aside and say, that diagnosis says you've got these kinds of things going on, symptoms, as opposed to a formal diagnosis. I'm not going to treat your formal diagnosis. Okay. Um, and to that end, if a medical doctor has diagnosed you with something and prescribed a medication to treat that diagnosis, I cannot get in the middle of that relationship either. And so um, what I often tell patients is that I will not tell you to go against your medical doctor's advice. If you want to get off of the medication I applaud you for wanting to do that. That is not a long-term sustainable approach. Medication was designed initially to interrupt some signaling. You're either um, blocking the, the signal that is trying to meet a receptor or you're like, meeting that receptor with another signal. But that's what the medication's trying to do. It's either a blocker or a, a signaler. That's super layman's terms. <laughs> so um, any medical doctor's probably going, really? Did she just describe it that way? Um, but, uh, but basically what happens then is you're buying yourself time to figure out what's going on. But that's not what tends to happen. What tends to happen is rather than just looking at it like it's buying us time and we're only going to be on this medication for three or six months while we figure out what was really causing the problem and, and um, make some adjustments because people just want a quick fix. And if the medication works in the short term, they're like, oh, the medication is working I don't have to change a thing. I just will take this medication forever. And what happens is 
the medication doesn't work forever for a lot of different reasons. If, even if the medication is still working, it's creating other issues, which then leads to another medication, that sort of thing. So back to your question about the medication, if somebody comes to me and says, I want to get off this medication, I say, I cannot ha- like work in between you and your prescribing physician. So you need to go back to your prescribing physician Tell them that you would like to get off this medication, that you're going to work with a complementary medicine practitioner, whether that's me or somebody else. You're going to work with a complementary medicine practitioner to make some lifestyle adjustments. So you're going to need help monitoring your situation so that you can reduce the dose little by little until you get off of it completely. A lot of these medications are super strong disruptors to your system. And so just cold turkey going off of them can really create a problem, um, especially if you've been taking something long-term. Um, some of the um, medications that are used in the mental health world in particular are extremely disruptive. And, um, and there are people that once their brain has become accustomed to that chemical disruption can never go completely off that medication. They, they have a really um, bad reaction if they ever go completely off of it, which begs the case for never starting. Right. (laughs) But, um, but that's not a relationship that I was privy to. That was not a, uh, nobody consulted me. If somebody consulted me and they came to, came to me and they said, my doctor just recommended that I go on this medication, but I'm not sure I want to do that. Like, what do you think? I would say, well, again, I'm not going to go against your medical doctor's advice. So that's between you and your medical doctor. But if you want to try a few things before you finally say, okay, I'm going to have to Um, go on this medication, let's work with your medical doctor and let's monitor your condition over the next six months while you're trying to make some of these adjustments and see if you can make these adjustments and eliminate the need for the, um, the medication. Okay, that's really helpful to know because I know our listeners will be thinking too, some of them now with all the information out there that maybe just some meditation and some acupuncture will solve a lifelong history of X, Y, and Z, whatever it could be. And that's not always the case. So uh, what you're saying is it's complementary. You can do both, but that you would work with, which all complementary therapists should be doing, you would work with the physician. Um, but that you're not there to interrupt or to advise on medical issues that you're not trained to do. So that's straightforward and helpful information for our listeners to to hear so that they can go to a medical doctor, get the advice, and then they should make informed decisions. They should do their research as well. Um, Otherwise, it will all come back to you. (laughs) I'll come back on you. Well, you told me I should come off of this. You told well, me. You know, I have a, I have patients come to me regularly that, um, you know, they, um, my services aren't cover, covered by health insurance. You guys have socialized medicine in the UK. We don't have that here. So, you know, my services aren't covered by health insurance. If somebody's seeing me, they're paying out of pocket for it. And so they, will still go to their medical doctor and access the system for certain services that are just sort of standard things like blood work twice a year, that sort of thing. If I, if I'm really looking for something in particular, I might want more in depth blood work that they're, that the insurance is not going to agree to run. So that's a another issue. But, um, but they'll come to me after just having seen their medical doctor and running 
you know, updated blood work. And they were like, well, my medical doctor told me to keep doing whatever one, whatever I'm doing because my blood work is looking great. <laughs> and so, um, so for me, that's a testament to, you know, what we're doing is making a difference. And, um, and anytime you can get a medical, you can get in and out of a medical doctor's office without them trying to put you on a new medication, you are doing pretty well. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's a really good point. Yes, absolutely. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Let's talk about stress for a minute, because I know that you do a lot of work around stress, toxic stress as well. And I just want to try and help our listeners understand, our viewers as well, because this will be on YouTube, to understand, hello YouTube, to understand exactly what a toxic toxic stress might look like and what does it mean? So that's a really good question. And I want to just go back um, a few moments ago where you said, that some of your viewers might think that they could just practice meditation, make a couple of other adjustments, and the problem will go away. Use acupuncture, you know, meditate and use acupuncture, and the problem will go away. And so the way I typically explain it is that um, we have certain processes we might use, like just imagine most of us have taken a yoga class and a lot of yoga classes will start with some sort of breathing exercise. And, um, and I, in my molt method program, I have a breathing exercise that I have incorporated into one of the modules, um, that, um, I teach people how to practice because it's super something super easy. You can do literally if you're sitting at a stoplight, you know, uh, my molt method program. And, um, and so if you have some sort of technique, I don't care if you use the one I recommend or you, if you go to yoga class and um, let's just say you went to yoga class and you know how you feel at the end of yoga class where you're all like Zen and totally relaxed and you're thinking, oh man, I'm, I'm like so floating on a cloud. This is going to last for three days, right? And an hour later, your system's like back on overdrive and you're wired and you're like, man, like, why doesn't it last? Why, why, when I really put in the effort um, to soothe my nervous system, to, to relax, to reduce stress, it's not lasting. And so there, you know, it is possible that you just have a crazy stressful life, you know, that basically you stepped out of your yoga class, turned your phone back on and got on the phone with somebody who just always knows how to push your buttons. Like that's a, that's not what I'm referring to here. That is a problem, certainly. But if you just find that for like no apparent reason, your system just goes right back to, um, like anxious and, um, and feeling that, that we know how that stress feels in our body. Most of us, um, if that's happening, then there tends to be some sort of internal stressor that is, um, causing your internal systems, your nervous system in particular to stay on overdrive. And, um, and it's like your, body thinks that there's a lion in the bushes and that at any moment in time, that lion is going to jump out of the bushes and start chasing you and you need to be ready to run. And, um, and um, so if that stress is coming back, if that feeling of anxiousness is coming back, then that points to toxic stress. And toxic stress is the type of stress that no amount of meditating is going to um, reduce. You know, for a moment, you'll feel a little better, but um, but toxic stress has got to be detoxed. And, um, and then that 
um, forces us to identify what type or category of toxin has built up to the point where it's toxic in your body, because that will then inform the um, specialized protocol we use to pull it out. Okay, that's interesting. So it's something that's built up to become toxic, prolonged, and therefore need you need to get to the root of it, would you say, or you need to dig deep? How would you describe it? And what would I say you gotta pull it out by its roots? You know how if you like have weeds in your garden and you just like pick the stuff off the surface and then you go out there two days later and you're like, really? There it is again, you know, you got to get that root, that weed out by the roots. And if you get it out by the roots, then it doesn't come back. If it does come back, it takes a really long time, right? So we live in a toxic world. There is no avoiding it. There are toxins everywhere. And, you know, unless you want to live on a mountaintop with no internet access off the grid, like, which I know I don't want to live like that. Right. <laughs> you know, I like, um, I like living, you know, a full and fulfilling life, mixing it up in the normal world. And so if you are one of those people, which I believe most of us are, um, you are going to regularly need to monitor how much stress has built up in your body and just, be regularly doing things that help kind of keep it under control. And how does stress turn toxic? Because as you say, life will bring normal stressors. So how does it turn toxic? You know, that's a, um, a very individual case by case basis. Um, many people get away with one type of toxicity like take cigarette smoking um for example we most of us know that cigarette smoking is bad for you and it leads to lung cancer and all sorts of other issues and then and then we see the person who's been smoking since they were 13 and they're in their nineties and, you know, maybe they have a little emphysema and, and, you know, they have that disgusting smoker's cough, but they're still alive and kicking, you know, like they didn't get cancer. <laughs> and then you've got the person like um, uh, Christopher Reeves. I don't know if you remember the Superman um guy who had the he had an accident and ended up being a paraplegic oh. and he passed away that was many years ago but his um wife and widow developed lung cancer and she had never smoked and um the guess if you want to call it that cuz you really can never know after the fact but the the thought was that it possibly was some sort of environmental toxin that she was breathing in long term that um, had the same effect as if you're smoking, you know, and um, and because of all the stress she was under caring with Christopher, you know, all of that, uh, those additional factors that were unique to her, she her body couldn't handle everything, you know? And so that's the, that's one of the things that makes it extremely challenging because people say, if this was true, if this was really the way it works, then everybody who ha has this situation would become sick. And my book, my tricky to toxins chapter in my book, What's Your Kryptonite? Um, I share a story of Julie. And Julie um, had some, I call it kryptonite, toxic stressors uh, are kryptonite. And um, Julie had become wheelchair bound just over an extended period of time where nobody could figure out what was creating her health issues. And um, she, she'd been to every doctor and they'd run a, every test you could imagine. And um, 
just um, I was not treating Julie, um, but I knew her and her situation. Um, and just through kind of divine intervention, she um, was introduced to somebody who speculated that she might have mold toxicity. And they ended up determining that, in fact, there was mold in the house where she lived. And um, and they ended up having to move because remediation was not safe for her um, because she was really advanced. And if you understand how mold works, mold, um, the mold spores then sort of colonize in your body. So not only do you have to get out of the environment where you're complete, you know, regularly refreshing that, but now you've got to detox all of that, um, activity that's colonized in your body. But, um, but it was interesting because she had kids, she had a husband, they all lived there and none of them had the severe kind of issues that she had. So there's some combination of her genetics maybe how much time she spent in the house versus how much time the other members of the family spent in the house. Um, Some combination there led to her having a a health crisis and the other people not. So no one would ever think to look to the home environment as the source of the toxicity because other people are living in the house and that's not, it didn't cause a problem for them. But anyway, when she moved out of there, went through a proper detox protocol, um, she regained her health. I got out of the wheelchair, got back to creating music. Um, so, um, so it's a, it's a conundrum for sure. And, um, and, you know, people want, um, an easy, you know, um, just do this. And this will solve the problem. And unfortunately, if it was that easy, it wouldn't be a chronic problem because it would be easy to solve. So um, uh, depending on what type of toxicity has caused a problem, it will require a different type of detoxing protocol to support your body in removing it. Like, all of Julie's family members needed to detox the mold, right? But Julie's health depended on it, right? The other people in the family were managing the effects of it. Our body's an incredible self-healing machine, right? And it it handles all these toxins all day long, 24 seven, right? Even when we're sleeping, you know, it's dealing for most of us, we've got the Wi-Fi pinging through the house all night. It's dealing with the energetic disturbance from that. It's potentially dealing with airborne toxins from, you know, the air we're breathing. So, you know, even when we think we're sleeping and we're not consuming toxicity, there's still toxins being introduced, right? And so our body's great at handling it. It's not that it it can't handle it. It's just that sometimes um depending on whatever cocktail of circumstances has gone on for one person it will have become toxic to the point where the body needs some extra help getting rid of it. Okay, so as you say case by case Mm -hmm. It it has to be case by case, unfortunately. Of course. And, you know, you mentioned your book, which I was going to come to. uh, And but you also mentioned the word kryptonite, which I love. I often use it sometimes as, you know, people's kryptonite or Achilles heel, whichever one you want to. So your book, What is Your Kryptonite? You're an author. So first of all, congratulations with that. It's not easy to be an author. People think. Oh, it's not. It's a it's definitely a lot of work. So absolutely. Can you tell us about that and why that title? So um, when I was working on the book, the book had been in the works for quite a few years and um, and I had determined that I really needed to get it out there. Um, And so I was talking to somebody about potential names for it. And I was 
just discussing basically what I was going to cover. And, um, and I um, mentioned, I said, it's kind of like your kryptonite, you know? And he said, whoa, 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 what did you just say? And I said, well, it's like kryptonite. Um, these stressors are like kryptonite. And so, um, so that's where the name came from. And um, I thought it was particularly appropriate because let's go back to Julie's example. Um, the toxic mold in her home was invisible, right? Like it wasn't like it was sitting out on the dining room table and, um, and all she had to do was look at it and say, this is probably not healthy. I'm going to put this out in the yard, you know, um, rather something's draining her energy and she can feel that happening, but she's got no idea what it is. Um, or where it is more importantly. And that's kind of how kryptonite is in the super um, human world. Um, they, because they know what kryptonite does to them, they feel their energy being drained and they say, wow, you know, there's gotta be kryptonite here somewhere um, because my energy is draining. And so I've got to find it and get rid of it in order to restore my superpowers. Right. And so, um, so I just thought it was a very appropriate analogy and, um, and that's, um, exactly what we have to do with toxic stressors. Um, sometimes toxic stressors have to be managed. Like we kind of know they're toxic, but they have to be managed. For example, um, Wi-Fi, and even just working on the computers, the blue screens and, and that sort of thing, it would be better for us if we didn't expose our eyeballs <laughs> to blue screen light. It would be better for us if we didn't expose our energy system to 5G and Wi-Fi and that sort of thing. But our world revolves around that, right? And so it's not practical to think we're going to be able to completely operate without um without being exposed. So we've just got to do things that help us to manage that toxicity and remove or reduce the toxicity wherever we can so that the toxicity we have no control over isn't enough to cause a real problem. And you were drawn to write the book to help people to understand or to be able to locate and identify perhaps what could be their kryptonite. Yes. Yes. And um, um, I mentioned earlier the Molt Method program. And in the book, um, I talk about the Molt Method and the different Molt is um, M-O-L-T is an acronym, Mindset, Order, Lifestyle, and Toxins. And, um, and molt is the way I talk about it is that, um, in nature, uh, um, any sort of creature molts when it's time for growth and change. Right. So I, I encourage readers to molt stress, right. To, you know, sort of shed it. And, um, and so in the toxins module, I have a, um, a guidebook that I put together. I call it the tricky toxins guidebook and it has a symptom survey that goes with it. So, um, so you have um, this symptom survey that you can kind of go through and look at the symptoms that you're having regularly. And then um, if they correlate to a type of toxicity that can help point you in the right direction. If you don't have access to, you know, my biofield, um, assessment tools. So, right. So, okay, that's great. So the book, all the links will be in the show notes, guys. Um, and also you can access this on Gala's website too. Just switching gears slightly, because, you know, I delve into philosophy and all that sort. Um, if you could live, and I don't know why I want to say 1800s, and I, I, I can't, I don't know what era. That might be Victorian era. It's next to Edwardian era. 
But let's say you lived in that time, in that era, because we live in, we're in the information age. It's a very interesting time in our lives. But if you lived in the Victorian times, what do you think you would be doing? I would be using homeopathy. Same thing I use now. I Now with the technology that I have, I actually can imprint into homeopathy with an energetic signature that kind of amplifies the effects of it. But, um, but homeopathy has been used for, you know, um, many, many centuries <laughs> and, um, and, um, you know, we, in some ways in the 1800s, um, then, alternative complementary natural medicine was the only medicine there was right so using plants as medicine using diet as me diet uh, modifications as medicine that was a given back then right and um and so if every medication now that's like a formal pharmaceutical medication, they're all based on plant medicine, but they've been, they've been, uh, uh, modified mm -hmm. to be, um, the way it's talked about from their perspective, they've been modified to make them more effective. But for those of us on the other side, we say all those modifications have added toxicity, created additional side effects, and they really only did it because they couldn't get it patented if they didn't have all these like crazy modifications that supposedly made it um, something that was, um, you know, a special, their special sauce kind of thing. So, yes. Okay, yes. No, that's a good point. That's an interesting point. In the UK, there's a real surge now in mental health with psilocybin, which is plant-based mushroom for people who suffer from chronic depression. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some big universities, I won't name them all, but people in the UK will know, there's lots of trials at the moment. Now, some are for, some are against, but it's all natural medicine. Um, so I think in some ways, I, I, exactly what you said, but I wonder if maybe there is a little shift. Maybe it's just in the mental health field at the moment, but there is a little bit of shift where they are looking back at plant medicines. And this isn't counterculture. This isn't Timothy Leary. We're not talking about the 60s and Woodstock and all that, or the Monterey Festival. We're talking about c controlled trials a control group and somebody being assisted to help with it, which is exciting. It's opening yeah. up. I'm reading so much about it. Yeah. Um, years ago, it was called ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's basically, it's basically the plant medicine that was used by shamans right. um, in uh, primarily South and South and Central and South America. And, um, and so it's incredibly effective and the people who have used it medicinally for, you know, decades, centuries know the efficacy, but it has been um, kept out of the mainstream because it um, interferes with the ability for medical doctors to be able to prescribe certain things. And it's really not that different now in the United States over the last maybe five years or so, it's become really common for medical doctors to prescribe medical marijuana. And so it will be a similar sort of thing. Once the medical community figures out a way to kind of harness it in a way where they can prescribe it, they'll be prescribing that as well. But um, I caution anybody that any, anything that's meant to suppress a symptom, whether that is natural or pharmaceutical, 
is still interfering with what your body's trying to tell you. A symptom is just a sign that something's not working right. Right. And if you are suppressing that symptom long term, again, we talked in the beginning here that sometimes we need to suppress the symptoms for a few months, six months to buy us time to work on whatever it is that's um, that needs adjustment. But you never want to become dependent on medical marijuana, on psilocybin, ayahuasca, um, any sort of um, medication or natural remedy. Um, I Anything that I recommend is always recommended short term and we cycle things. You know, I don't I don't want our internal systems to become lazy. I want our body. We're just using supplements, homeopathy, you know, the other sort of treatment things that I recommend and prescribe. We're only using those to essentially remind the body, bridge the gap and remind the body of what it does naturally. Yes. You know, we, our body doesn't need all this extra supplement, um, a medication or, you know, natural, um, substances until it's internal processes get kind of clogged. And, um, and it, um, there's, you know, the energy matrix gets disrupted and, um, and just needs a little, um, clean up. Nine Peaches Therapy's self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by helping you to achieve confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. Created by an expert practitioner to help you to achieve the best result. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day using the most gentle and effective guided meditations to rid yourself of anxiety, stress, fear, and negative thinking. Available now on Spotify, Apple Music, and other platforms. Yes, so bringing, going to your daily life, what are the things that you do daily to help you to set yourself up for the day? Is there any routine that you follow that you feel works or helps? Yeah, so um, one of the things I do every day is um, do not hit the ground running the minute I get out of bed. When I get out of bed, I kind of transition and I usually, I have, um, I meditate. I may use, um, I use a frequency specific microcurrent. Um, and so I may treat a certain thing that I've kind of got going on. I want to support my body, uh, my body's healing and, um, and, um, recalibrating, if you will, the energy system, but I'll meditate, use my different tools. And I typically do that for a half an hour to an hour. You know, even if you've only got 15 or 20 minutes, that's enough, but don't just go from, um, sleeping, um, you know, the alarm goes off and you get up and hit, you know, hit the, on button on the coffee pot and you're off to the races. Like you need your nervous system needs a little transition period. And then it doesn't always happen first thing in the morning. It's best first thing in the morning, but at some point in the day, I get at least a half an hour of movement. It's best if that happens early in the day um, it's best if it happens in the daylight, even like in the UK where it's cloudy a lot, um, you're still getting that daylight through the clouds that hits your eyes and it helps to um, really um, um, regulate your circadian rhythms. So, um, so absolute best to just put on some clothes and go walk for a half an hour. Um, go walk outside, get some fresh air, get some daylight on your eyeballs and um, and move um, some kind of gentle movement 
for a half an hour is fantastic. It does not have to be crazy over the top exercise. And then when I need a, uh, like a little extra push, I will lean into fasting, um, either um, like time restricted eating or more extended fasting, just depending on what season I'm in and, and what I'm trying to accomplish. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, it sounds really nice. And you were saying meditation. Is that for relaxation and calmness? Um, is it just to center yourself? Why do you meditate? Why do I meditate? Because I get ornery after a few days of not meditating. <laughs> I've been meditating for so many years now. I don't know. That's a really good question. Uh, Shy. Uh, I haven't been asked that one in a long time, I guess. Um, I can't, I meditate because I can't imagine not meditating. You know, for those of you who have not established a meditation practice, take it from me. Once you get a, become accustomed to meditating, you will miss it when you don't. Um, one of the easiest ways to ease into meditation when you can't imagine just sitting there like silent um, is to journal. Um, journaling is kind of an, an active form of meditation and it allows you to have that um, dialogue with your, you know, crazy monkey mind that's going right and so um so just journaling in some kind of disciplined way um for a half an hour can be really helpful if you are um not feeling it to just sit and meditate um without some structure to it um there's a, a book called The Artist Way by Julia Cameron. Are you familiar with that book? So yes. um, so her practice in that book, I've recommended it to people for um, 30 years now. <laughs> um, but uh, that practice is three handwritten pages. And there's a process that she talks about you'd have to get her book and, and understand the whole process but she talks about the magic of disciplining yourself to handwrite three pages and i i wrote morning pages for over a year and maybe missed a couple of days in over a year um, many years ago now, it's been a long time. And, you know, sometimes I'll go through a period where I'm journaling more than I'm meditating and then I miss my meditation. So then I go back to meditating more than I journal. Um, but there's this magic that happens in the third page <laughs> that you, your logical brain will tell you you're done mm -hmm. about two thirds of the way through the second page. You'll hit this, like I've said all I need to say I'm done. And the real juicy magic happens when you push past that point through the end of the second page and into the third page. And then you're like, Holy moly, where did that come from? You know? And that's the, the, um, information that's been blocking us and, and creating, um, um, interference, essentially energetic interference. So, yes, well, I can certainly attest to the meditation bit. I certainly feel it when I don't do it after same for me with the yoga as well, I think mm -hmm. any routine, but mainly those for me. Uh, but yes, I love the, now I haven't done that exercise in years since I bought the book. Uh, but yes, um, thank you for that, because I think I'm going to have to do that again. So, yes, I learned so much when I interview people. It's amazing <laughs> stuff. And it brings me back to me. Yeah. So 
I appreciate it. But I so enjoyed this interview. And Gaylo, is there anything else you want to people to know? I'm going to, you know, signpost them to your website. Do you now with your I want to for the viewers out there, do you do this via Zoom? Can you still do because a lot of people will be asking, can you still do kinesiology and all this stuff via Zoom? I have because of the technology I use, I don't need to be in the same room with people to uh, work with them. So um, so that's not a problem if if somebody is interested in working with me. Um, you can find more information on my website and um, all my social channels. If you go down to the bottom of my homepage, um, so it's drgala.com, D-R-G-A-L-A.com. And at the bottom of the homepage are all the little badges for all the social channels. So wherever you um, like to connect, you can find me there. And um, and you'll be able to see the kinds of information that I regularly um you know, give my audience and then um, have an easy way to reach out to me and find out what your options are if you're interested in working with me more. That's excellent. And guys, the links will be in the show notes, actually, the Instagram, awesome. the website, the link to the book, all of it just drop down below. You'll see it all down below, but also go to our website as well. <laughs> Definitely go to the website. Uh, but yes, very interesting stuff. I love homeopathy. I love naturopathy. Love acupuncture, all of it. I've had all of them myself. I'm a huge proponent for, for it all. Um, and it's such a joy to speak to practitioners who uh, this is your day to day. This is what you do. This is what your dedication has been to your life. You're obviously doing your life's work. Uh, you're in the zone with that. And even in the 1800s, you would have been doing it. So confirmation, what a, talk about life choice and past life choice, if you can yeah. believe those things. I know everybody yeah. doesn't. But yeah. yeah, talk about life choice. So thank you. This has been fascinating and really informative. Any last words? Just encourage people to become their own PCP. And that's primary care person. So um, if you don't make yourself a priority, nobody else is going to. Oh, food for thought. My good, what a way to end. Brilliant stuff. If you don't do it, and many of us just skip over it. We know something's wrong, but we don't look at it. We wait and it builds. It becomes toxic, maybe. Thank you so much, Kayla. And thanks for having me, Shaw. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.